the presence of God and Gurus. Before that, let's tense our whole body with double inhalation. Hold, vibrate. <sighs> Gradually relax. Two more times. Inhale. Vibrate the whole body, bringing the tension of the day, the physical, mental, emotional, and letting them go. <sighs> One last time. Hold the vibration, tense to the maximum, and as you let go, <sighs> relax completely, bringing yourself completely into the session. Just scan your body once, your feet, calf muscles, Knees, thighs, abdomen. Breathe diaphragmatically. Chest is relaxed. Arms are relaxed. Shoulders, roll your shoulders and drop it down. Completely relax. Bring your energy into the astral spine, gazing up at the spiritual eye. Be in this moment. And let us invoke the presence of God and Gurus today. Divine Mother, Heavenly Father, Friend, Beloved God, Guru Preceptors, Jesus Christ, Babaji, Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar Ji, Beloved Guru Deva, Paramhansa Yogananda Ji, Saints and Sages of all religions, Dear Friend and Guide, Swami Kriyananda, Humbly we bow at Thy feet. Dear Masters of Kriya Yoga, we invoke thy presence here with us today. We offer our gratitude at thy feet for helping us to find thee, to find this path, to be able to practice Kriya, to be able to be here today, to understand these teachings in more depth. Babaji, Mataji, we invoke thy blessings, thy joy. May we be able to attune our will with thy will and always aspire to live our lives in accordance to thy will. Thy guidance, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Today we are also introduced Apart from Babaji, though this book had several references to Babaji, but here, uh, first time we get a description about him, very formally introduction to Babaji, and we are also introduced to Mataji, who is Babaji's sister. So keeping her in our hearts, let us chant this one. Uh what lightning flash glimmers in my face mother what lightning flash glimmers in my face Seeing the I am through and through, seeing the I am through and through. What lightning flash glimmers in thy face, mother? What lightning flash glimmers in thy face? Seeing the I am through and through, seeing the I am through and through. What Lightning flash, 
Flavors in thy face, mother, what lightning flash? Flavors in thy face, seeing the high and through, through and through, seeing the high and through, through and through, seeing the high and through, through and through, seeing the high and through, through and through. What lightning flash glimmers in thy face, mother? What lightning flash glimmers in thy face? Seeing the eye and through, through and through, seeing the eye and through, through and through, seeing the eye and through, through and through, seeing. Opening our hearts, love, devotion, offering this energy up into the spiritual eye at the feet of Mataji, who ensured that Babaji didn't drop his body and merge back into the cosmic consciousness, and offering our love and gratitude to Babaji. To accept it just for a moment visualize Mataji and Babaji together lightning flash on her face that of Divine Mother So, all this while, right from chapter 1, we have been reading Babaji, the name of Babaji, the name of Lahiri Mahashaya, various disciples of Lahiri Mahashaya. But last chapter was a formal introduction to Lahiri Mahashaya, who he was or still is. And in this chapter, a formal introduction to Babaji. Probably this was the first time that Babaji was introduced to this world. Nobody knew about him as is mentioned in this chapter. These days we hear a lot of people saying that, you know, so-called gurus saying that they had an interaction with Babaji and they have met him and they got a dispensation from him and they know his Kriya. Maybe we don't know. But for us, what we know about Babaji is what our master has told us and as he says there is no need for us to know anything more than what he has given us because for our path whatever is needed he has already given us so with that openness let us read about Babaji and then we will discuss this chapter Chapter 33, Babaji, the Yogi Christ of Modern India The northern Himalayan crags near Badrinarayan are still blessed by the living presence of Babaji, Guru of Lahiri Mahashai. The secluded master has retained his physical form for centuries, perhaps for millenniums. The deathless Babaji is an avatar. This Sanskrit word means descent. Its roots are ava, down, and tri, to pass. In the Hindu scriptures, avatara signifies the descent of divinity into flesh. Babaji's spiritual state is beyond human comprehension, Sri Yukteswar explained to me. The dwarfed vision of men cannot pierce to his transcendental star. One attempts in vain even to picture the avatar's attainment. It is inconceivable. 
The Upanishads have minutely classified every stage of spiritual advancement. A Siddha, or perfected being, has progressed from the state of a Jivan Mukta, freed while living, to that of a Param Mukta, supremely free, full power over death. The latter has completely escaped from the Mayak thraldom and its reincarnational round. The Param Mukta therefore seldom returns to a physical body. If he does, he is an avatar, a divinely appointed medium of supernal blessings on the world. An avatar is unsubject to the universal economy. His pure body, visible as a light image, is free from any debt to nature. The casual gaze may see nothing extraordinary in an avatar's form, but it casts no shadow nor makes any footprint on the ground. These are outward symbolic proofs of an inward lack of darkness and material bondage. Such a God-man alone knows the truth behind the relativities of life and death. Omar Khayyam, so grossly misunderstood, sang of this liberated man in his immortal scripture, the Rubaiyat, Ah, moon of my delight, who knowest no wane, the moon of heaven is rising once again. How oft hereafter rising shall she look through this same garden after me in vain? The moon of delight is God, eternal polaris, anachronous never. The moon of heaven is the outward cosmos, fettered to the law of periodic recurrence. Its chains had been dissolved forever by the Persian seer through his self-realization. How oft hereafter rising shall she look after me in vain? What frustration of search by a frantic universe for an absolute omission? Christ expressed his freedom in another way, and a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Spacious with omnipresence, could Christ indeed be followed, except in the overarching spirit? Krishna, Rama, Buddha, and Patanjali were among the ancient Indian avatars, a considerable poetic literature in Tamil has grown up around Agastya, a South Indian avatar. He worked many miracles during the centuries preceding and following the Christian era and is credited with retaining his physical form even to this day. Babaji's mission in India has been to assist prophets in carrying out their special dispensations. He thus qualifies for the scriptural classification of Mahavatar, Great Avatar. He has stated that he gave yoga initiation to Shankara, ancient founder of the Swami order, and to Kabir, famous medieval saint. His chief 19th century disciple was, as we know, Lahiri Mahashai, revivalist of the lost Kriya art. The Mahavatar is in constant communion with Christ. Together they send out vibrations of redemption and have planned the spiritual technique of salvation for this age. The work of these two fully illumined masters, one with the body and one without it, is to inspire the nations to forsake suicidal wars, race hatreds, religious sectarianism, and the boomerang evils of materialism. Babaji is well aware of the trend of modern times, especially of the influence and complexities of Western civilization, and realizes the necessity of spreading the self-liberations of yoga equally in the West and in the East. That there is no historical reference to Babaji need not surprise us. The great guru has never openly appeared in any century. The misinterpreting glare of publicity has no place in his millennial plans. Like the creator, 
the sole but silent power. Babaji works in a humble obscurity. Great prophets like Christ and Krishna come to earth for a specific and spectacular purpose. They depart as soon as it is accomplished. Other avatars like Babaji undertake work which is concerned more with the slow evolutionary progress of man during the centuries than with any one outstanding event of history. Such masters always veil themselves from the gross public gaze and have the power to become invisible at will. For these reasons, and because they generally instruct their disciples to maintain silence about them, a number of towering spiritual figures remain world unknown. I give in these pages on Babaji merely a hint of his life, only a few facts which he deems it fit and helpful to be publicly imparted. No limiting facts about Babaji's family or birthplace, dear to the analyst's heart, have ever been discovered. His speech is generally in Hindi, but he converses easily in any language. He has adopted the simple name of Babaji, which is revered father, other titles of respect given him by Lahiri Mahasaya's disciples are Mahamuni Babaji Maharaj, Supreme Ecstatic Saint, Mahayogi, Greatest of Yogis, Trambak Baba and Shiva Baba, titles of avatars of Shiva. Does it matter that we know not the patronymic of an earth-released master? Whenever anyone utters with reverence the name of Baba Jilahiri Marsh, I said, that devotee attracts an instant spiritual blessing. The deathless guru bears no marks of age on his body. He appears to be no more than a youth of twenty-five, fair-skinned, of medium build and height. Babaji's beautiful, strong body radiates a perceptible glow. His eyes are dark calm and tender. His long, lustrous hair is copper-colored. A very strange fact is that Babaji bears an extraordinarily exact resemblance to his disciple Lahiri Mahasaya. The similarity is so striking that in his later years Lahiri Mahasaya might have passed as the father of the youthful-looking Babaji. Swami Kebalananda, my saintly Sanskrit tutor, spent some time with Babaji in the Himalayas. The peerless master moves with his group from place to place in the mountains, Kebalananda told me. His small band contains two highly advanced American disciples. After Babaji has been in one locality for some time, he says, Dera Danda Utao, let us lift our camp and staff. He carries a symbolic danda, bamboo staff. His words are the signal for moving with his group instantaneously to another place. He does not always employ this method of astral travel. Sometimes he goes on foot from peak to peak. Babaji can be seen or recognized by others only when he so desires. He is known to have appeared in many slightly different forms to various devotees, sometimes without a beard and moustache, sometimes with them. As his undecaying body requires no food, the master seldom eats. As a social courtesy to visiting disciples, he occasionally accepts fruits or rice cooked in milk and clarified butter. Two amazing incidents of Babaji's life are known to me, Kebalananda went on. His disciples were sitting one night around a huge fire which was blazing for a sacred Vedic ceremony. The master suddenly seized a burning log and lightly struck the bare shoulder of a chela who was close to the fire. Sir, how cruel! Lahiri Mahashai, who was present, made this remonstrance. Would you rather have seen him burned to ashes before your eyes, according to the decree of his past karma? With these words, Babaji placed his healing hand on the chela's disfigured shoulder. 
I have freed you tonight from painful death. The karmic law has been satisfied through your slight suffering by fire. On another occasion, Babaji's sacred circle was disturbed by the arrival of a stranger. He had climbed with astonishing skill to the nearly inaccessible ledge near the camp of the master. Sir, you must be the great Babaji. The man's face was lit with inexpressible reverence. For months I have pursued a ceaseless search for you among these forbidding crags. I implore you to accept me as a disciple. When the great guru made no response, the man pointed to the rocky chasm at his feet. If you refuse me, I will jump from this mountain. Life has no further value if I cannot win your guidance to the divine. Jump then, Babaji said unemotionally. I cannot accept you in your present state of development. The man immediately hurled himself over the cliff. Babaji instructed the shocked disciples to fetch the stranger's body. When they returned with the mangled form, the master placed his divine hand on the dead man. Lo, he opened his eyes and prostrated himself humbly before the Omnipotent One. You are now ready for discipleship. Babaji beamed lovingly on his resurrected Chela. You have courageously passed a difficult test. Death shall not touch you again. Now you are one of our immortal flock. Then he spoke his usual words of departure, Deiradanda Utao. The whole group vanished from the mountain. An avatar lives in the omnipresent spirit. For him there is no distance in verse to the square. Only one reason, therefore, can motivate Babaji in maintaining his physical form from century to century. The desire to furnish humanity with a concrete example of its own possibilities. Where man never vouchsafed a glimpse of divinity in the flesh, he would remain oppressed by the heavy, mayic delusion that he cannot transcend his mortality. Jesus knew from the beginning the sequence of his life. He passed through each event not for himself, not from any karmic compulsion, but solely for the upliftment of reflective human beings. His four reporter disciples, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, recorded the ineffable drama for the benefit of later generations. For Babaji also there is no relativity of past, present, future. From the beginning he has known all phases of his life. Yet, accommodating himself to the limited understanding of men, he has played many acts of his divine life in the presence of one or more witnesses. Thus it came about that a disciple of Lahiri Mahashai was present when Babaji deemed the time to be ripe for him to proclaim the possibility of bodily immortality. He uttered this promise before Ram Gopal Mojumdar that it might finally become known for the inspiration of other seeking hearts. The Great Ones speak their words and participate in the seemingly natural course of events solely for the good of man. Even as Christ said, Father, I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. During my visit at Ranbajpur with Ram Gopal, the sleepless saint, he related the wondrous story of his first meeting with Babaji. I sometimes left my isolated cave to sit at Lairi Mahashai's feet in Benares, Ram Gopal told me. One midnight, as I was silently meditating in a group of his disciples, the master made a surprising request. Ram Gopal, he said, go at once to the Dasasamid bathing ghat. I soon reached the secluded spot. The night was bright with moonlight and the glittering stars. After I had sat in patient silence for a while, my attention was drawn to a huge stone slab near my feet. It rose gradually 
revealing an underground cave. As the stone remained balanced in some unknown manner, the draped form of a young and surpassingly lovely woman was levitated from the cave high into the air. Surrounded by a soft halo, she slowly descended in front of me and stood motionless, steeped in an inner state of ecstasy. She finally stirred and spoke gently. I am Mataji, the sister of Babaji. I have asked him, and also Lahiri Mahashai, to come to my cave tonight to discuss a matter of great importance. A nebulous light was rapidly floating over the Ganges. The strange luminescence was reflected in the opaque waters. It approached nearer and nearer, until, with a blinding flash, it appeared by the side of Mataji and condensed itself instantly into the human form of Lahiri Mahashai. He bowed humbly at the feet of the woman saint. Before I had recovered from my bewilderment, I was further wonderstruck to behold a circling mass of mystical light travelling in the sky. Descending swiftly, the flaming whirlpool neared our group and materialized itself into the body of a beautiful youth who, I understood at once, was Babaji. He looked like Lairi Mahashai, the only difference being that Babaji appeared much younger and had long, bright hair. Lahiri Mahashai, Mataji, and myself knelt at the Guru's feet. An ethereal sensation of beatific glory thrilled every fiber of my being as I touched his divine flesh. Blessed sister, Babaji said, I am intending to shed my form and plunge into the infinite current. I have already glimpsed your plan, beloved master. I wanted to discuss it with you tonight. Why should you leave your body? The glorious woman looked at him beseechingly. What is the difference if I were a visible or invisible wave on the ocean of my spirit? Mataji replied with a quaint flash of wit. Deathless Guru, if it makes no difference, then please do not ever relinquish your form. Be it so, Babaji said solemnly. I will never leave my physical body. I will always remain visible to at least a small number of people on this earth. The Lord has spoken his own wish through your lips. As I listened in awe to the conversation between these exalted beings, the great Guru turned to me with a benign gesture. Fear not, Ram Gopal, he said. You are blessed to be a witness at the scene of this immortal promise. As the sweet melody of Babaji's voice faded away, his form and that of Lahiri Mahashai slowly levitated and moved backward over the Ganges. An aureole of dazzling light templed their bodies as they vanished into the night sky. Mataji's form floated to the cave and descended, the stone slab closed of itself, as if working on an invisible leverage. Infinitely inspired, I wended my way back to Lahiri Mahashai's place. As I bowed before him in the early dawn, my guru smiled at me understandingly. I am happy for you, Ramgopal, he said. The desire of meeting Babaji and Mataji which you have often expressed to me, has found at last a sacred fulfillment. My fellow disciples informed me that Lahiri Mahashai had not moved from his dais since early the preceding evening. He gave a wonderful discourse on immortality after you had left for the Dasasamid Ghat, one of the Chelas told me. For the first time I fully realized the truth in the scriptural verses which state that a man of self-realization can appear at different places in two or more bodies at the same time. Lahiri Mahashai later explained to me many metaphysical points concerning the hidden divine plan for this earth, Ram Gopal concluded. Babaji has been chosen by God 
to remain in his body for the duration of this particular world cycle. Ages shall come and go, still the deathless master, beholding the drama of the centuries, shall be present on this stage terrestrial. What description, no? I mean, it almost feels like we are watching a, you know, a sci-fi movie. People just emerging as light and then going back. But this happened. This actually happened, right? That's the difference. It's, it's, it's a movie of this creation that Ram Gopal got to see. So, uh, I mean, what do we discuss about this chapter? So the, here, the first page, where he says that, Sri Yukteswar says that Babaji's spiritual state, state is beyond human comprehension. So with our limited understanding, we will never be able to understand what Babaji is truly about. Like how we can never really uh, understand what God is, right? Uh, each one of us what we understand from the scriptures or what Guru tells us. We make our own conclusions, but it's never the full uh, thing like how Master had once told the story you know, of a man who, whose sons were uh, blind and uh, he, ha he was a Mahot, so he had an elephant and uh, he told his sons to wash the elephant one day and they were very happy, but they never had got the opportunity to wash. So each one was washing one part and then uh, once it got over, one voice said, Oh, I know now uh, how an elephant looks like. So he says, it's like this long, big trunk of a tree. The other one said, Oh, you don't know what it looks like. It is like, you know, big leaves. So he said, what are you talking? The third one says, you guys are all stupid. It is, you know, the, the other one, the other one was, you know, the second guy was doing the, um, years so he, he felt like it was huge leaves whereas this fellow was doing the trunk the other guy said no no it's like four big pillars he was washing the uh, the legs and it went on you know one said it is like a wall the last one said that you know it is like a thread hanging from the sky because he was uh, uh, you know, washing the tail and then they started fighting because each one had felt what it was and they were very, uh, I mean, they were right at the end of the day, what they were washing. So, and then they, they all started fighting. Finally, the father came and he said, just stop it. He said, uh, all of you are right and then all of you are wrong. So they said, how is that possible that all of us are right and all of us are wrong? He said, each one of you have only seen a part of, not seen or felt a part of the elephant, but I have seen the elephant in its entirety so who is that father his father is a self-realized master only they know um, god in entirety the rest of us just know a part of it and that's what is happening in this world right each one is saying what i am saying god is is the right uh, description of god he is all of it and he is none of it right he is me beyond it he is formless so similarly he's saying that uh, it's not possible for human comprehension the dwarfed vision of man which is you know the physical eyes cannot pierce to his transcendental star what is the star transcendental star it is the star we see in the spiritual eye and uh, master said that when the yogi in his deep uh, meditation is able to get into that spiritual eye the tunnel it opens like a tunnel and finally the five-pointed star when he enters that five-pointed star is when he is fully liberated he enters the cosmic consciousness so uh, that that is a transcendental star babaji is that is part of that transcendental star he says one attempts in vain even to picture the avatar's attainment and then he goes on to explain what is who is an avatar. So he's saying that you know there are these Jivan Muktas. Jivan Muktas are ones who have attained Nirvikalp Samadhi. And uh, uh, 
they still have little bit of karma that uh, are still there from past incarnations but um, they they are not so bothered about it even if they are there it's i mean it doesn't affect uh, to some come back and work it out but it's not something that really needs to be done with and whereas a siddha he says are parmuktas where they have completely uh, you know overcome every karma they have finished uh, everything and are fully liberated they are one with the infinite and there is no need for them to come back why do we need to come back when there are karmas uh, to work with and that is why some jivan muktas come back to you know help their disciples or something they keep a part of their karma as it doesn't really affect them but that is what helps them to keep coming back whereas a g the paramukta who don't have any karma left don't have to come back yet if they come back is because they are avatars they are divinely appointed so there is a uh, in this whole plan of god if there is a particular need then they appoint uh, god appoints an avatar to descend as he says they descend now uh, they come down they, uh, that's what the sanskrit word that means descend the root is uh, ava means down and three means to pass so they descend down to the um, planet and do what needs to be what has been their dispensation so uh, an avatar is not subject to universal economy because they are not really using or living this uh, caught up they are not bound by maya right because we are because we have various karmas to work so we keep coming back and we are bound we are breathing the air we have to follow all the laws of karma everything gravitation everything that this might world uh, is has has to we have to follow it they don't have to because they are have descended and they are here for a particular purpose they are basically light who are just who seem very normal when you we see we won't be able to see oh he's an avatar they look very normal but they aren't and uh, as he says here how do you find out if uh, you know he's saying his pure body visible as a light image is free from any debt to nature okay because there's no karma so there's no debt to the nature the casual gaze may see nothing extraordinary as an avatar's form but it casts no shadow that is what sets it apart that an avatar's body casts no shadow and doesn't make any footprints on the ground uh, you know even for master uh, there was a time when you know he had taken uh, karma of his disciples and uh, he couldn't walk and they had to carry him the monks would carry him downstairs his or room was upstairs they would carry him downstairs and then uh, one fine day there was this talk and he suddenly started walking and swami ji mentions that you know it felt as if he wasn't really his feet were not really touching the ground when he was walking he was walking very nicely so then you know you could make out that you know what he was on he couldn't walk he had to be carried was it's just a uh, leela right and uh, and he said when he was walking he felt as if you know his feet were not touching the ground and that is what is said about even uh, ananda mohima we will read about her in uh, further chapter they say that when she walked she she was this very petite uh, uh, woman but when uh, swami ji said that when she would walk it was like a general you know but um, the, it would seem like you know her feet are not touching the 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 ground so amazing so these are um, okay see the, he says these are outer outward symbol proofs of an inward lack of darkness and material bondage so we feel the weight uh you know when we get up our uh, you know as we are aging the knees cry <laughs> the knees creak everything you know we feel the this body for them th there is no darkness and there is no material bondage so they are just light um they are just put together the cells into a body so that you know we, he they can interact with us and we can see them such a god like man alone known as 
known the uh, knows the truth behind the relativity of life and death so then here he goes on to say that you know he talks about chiranjeevi there uh, uh, where he talks about krishna rama you know like uh, the christians say that jesus christ was the only son of god the uh, master often said that how is that possible anybody uh, you know uh, who has found god who is a self realized master everyone is equal at that level then it's not like he is more son of god and he is less son of god each one of them is 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 the same and uh, um, now krishna he say talks about chiranjeevi uh, he talks first about the avatars like krishna rama buddha patanjali they were all avatars okay i think my thing this thing was not working properly internet baba ji's mission in india has been to assist assist that was his mission right that is why he was here and we are lucky that he was he is in india has been to assist prophets in carrying out their special dispensation so he is like you know the back end of all these prophets too uh, and he he goes on to say that baba ji himself said that he gave yoga initiation to shankara adi shankara acharya that's what he was saying and um, uh, kabir and many others right maha avatars uh, lahiri mahashaya being one of them then maha uh, avatar uh, is in constant communion so I, in the last class also i mentioned this so uh, this path uh, the whole uh, reason why we are here is because jesus christ had uh, you know uh, approached baba ji to uh, help uh, people in the west he said my people have forgotten true christianity so he asked him to help with that and that is what it is he says he is in com- constant communion with christ together they send out vibrations of redemption and have planned the spiritual technique of salvation for this age and what is this age this is not as uh, i mean that's again a very long discussion but as sri yukteswar in his book holy science says that you know there is there was a wrong calculation at the time when krishna had departed from the planet that was uh, descending dwapar yuga and uh, yudhishthir and others were saying oh kali yuga is approaching so let us you know um, go home home bound so they go up the himalayas leaving the uh, the kingdom with parikshit uh, their uh, grandson and that time is when kali yuga came so obviously it was period of low consciousness all wise men had departed uh, and at that time the uh, uh, mistake um, error uh, creeped in in the almanac and uh, instead of you know the limited period that kali yuga would be there they have to calculate something to do with daiva yuga and all they put it all together and they said the kali yuga is for 4 lakh 32000 years and that means we are hardly you know even uh, touch the ba- um, the start of it we are right which is not true he said he had given us a calculation of how it has already ended and uh, proper um, uh, dwapar yuga the ascending dwapar yuga because it's all in a cycle right the ascending dwapar yuga has um already started in 1900 and uh, so this is ascending dwapar yuga and for ascending dwapar yuga the mahavatar baba ji and christ have planned the spiritual technique of salvation for this age and which is kriya yoga right the work of these two full uh, fully illumined master one with the body which is baba ji and the other without it is to inspire the nations to forsake suicidal wars race hatreds very important no 
religious sectarianism and boomeranging evils of materialism. That is the mission of Babaji in the ascending Dwapar Yuga. Now, uh, uh, here he is talking about Babaji. Uh, avatars like Babaji undertake work which is concerned more with the slow. I mean, there are some avatars who come for a particular thing, you know, the blazing, uh, like Krishna who came and, you know, he there was this Mahabharat, he gave Bhagavad Gita and he departed once that, that mission was over. Ad, uh, Buddha came, Adi Shankaracharya came because, you know, people were losing touch with, uh, they were saying, oh, there is no God because Buddha had, they misinterpreted what Buddha had said. So uh, Shankaracharya had to come and he established all the, uh, you know, the marts and the temples and the rituals and then he departed. But here, Babaji uh, is one who is now, there is no particular mission. They, they are they, they're going through the longer rhythm of the slow evolutionary progress of man during the centuries than any, any one outstanding event of history. So this is important. And he says that if such masters always veil themselves from... So this is the reason uh, he was not known to public as such. And only when uh, master got the sanction from Babaji to share is when he has shared about it. And only what he has agreed to share, where he says no limiting facts about Babaji's family or birthplace. It's not necessary to know. That's what he's saying. Later on, you know, other people have said, oh, there, there is one in uh, down south where he was born. And I mean, the various stories around it, we don't know how true they are or not true. But it's not necessary, as he's saying, that what Babaji is and why he is here, the, the, any other, like, you know, his the details about his, where he came from, what, who was, it's not very limiting. It's totally unnecessary is what he's talking about. So, he, and this, this is very important. He says, whenever anyone utters with reverence the name of Babaji, that devotee attracts an instant spiritual blessing. So, this is a promise Babaji has given which Larry Masha is telling us. So, you know, any time, any time, uh, this is something we can we do a japa on his name, right? Because the more we, we remember him, we will be, every time he says, he, that devotee attracts an instant spiritual blessing. And it's a promise to each one of us. And then, you know, this is again, um, the, when he's describing Babaji's, uh, how he looks, is something that we can visualize and meditate upon. Um, these are important uh, ways to, to connect with him uh, in our meditations. And then he's, uh, Swami Kevalananda is uh, sharing uh, some details about it where he talks about, now again, you know, we, we always thought that uh, only when Master Paramahansa Yogananda was sent to the West is when uh, Kriya Yoga was introduced to the West. Americans came to know about But here he says that his small band contains two highly advanced American disciples. Very interesting, no? After Babaji had been uh, in one locality, he would say, Dera Danda Utao, and they would go away. Danda is like, you know, that staff. Um, Interestingly, again, Adi Shankaracharya always, you know, that, that uh, I mean, after that, he established the Shankaracharya mat and all. All of them carry this staff. It's a reminder for the staff, which is this Meru Dhand, is what we, we say, you know, the, mm, this, the spine, the astral spine, which is the, uh, to keep it straight, the, to always remember that, you know, to live in this, uh, um, the astral spine and keep your, our, consciousness at the spiritual life. That is the purpose of a yogi. So to keep that, they always carry that staff with them and they would just pick it up and go away. It says that uh, Babaji can be seen or recognized by others only when he so desires. He is known to have appeared in many slightly different forms to various devotees, sometimes without, be without beard and moustache and sometimes with them. Who knows? I mean, isn't it a, a pleasant thought to uh, think someday we might cross him, we might meet him uh, as we are going about somewhere. 
So always keep looking out for him and uh, who knows in what form he will come and meet us. So such a beautiful thought to be uh, with and to always be ready for it, right? Okay. Um, and then again, now these two, uh, the incidents of Babaji's life, if you want to call it that, Kebalananda, he talks about one where he puts that um, that log, burning log on uh, one of his disciples. So this has been often, we have discussed this about, uh, you know, uh, each one of us has various karma, lots of karmas. And that's the reason we come, keep coming back, incarnating again and again. And who knows how much. And every incarnation, we bring a part of it that we want to work out, but we end up adding more karma. So there is this huge uh, backlog that we are carrying. But once uh, a, a devotee comes on the path and makes sincere efforts, now this disciple is with uh, Babaji, which, which means he's very highly advanced disciple, right? He must be self-realized to be accepted as his band. And even then, he was not completely free. There was still a karma that was left. And the guru allowed a part of it to happen because he didn't have to go through it because he had worked at, at attaining a certain level of evolution. So just a little bit. So each one of us has to remember that we are here. We are not completely free yet. But we are as long as we are making the sincere effort, spiritual effort, um, and the guru guru notices it when we are you know trying to be in tune when we are meditating we are trying to meditate we are trying to do everything that our guru has told then guru we have established that connection with the guru so he takes charge of our life and anything you know when something uh, comes upon us and we say oh why this has come up and sometimes as we are on the spiritual path doing kriya and all you realize, you sometimes feel that, you know, karma coming back back to back, kafi ara, very fast. That's because he wants us to evolve faster, just finish off. But let us understand that what he is allowing to come to us is only those that are necessary and uh, that will help us to evolve spiritually. And he is uh, diminishing the effect. Uh, probably it was much worse as he tells, would you rather uh, have seen him burn to ashes before your eyes according to the decree of his past karma? So whatever we are going through, when, when we have our complete faith in our guru and whatever difficulties or even good or bad, whatever is coming, know that master has allowed it to come to us. Only as much as I can take it, only as much as that is necessary. The rest is taken over. But again, let us understand one thing. The law of karma is exacting. What I have put out, everything has to uh, come back. It has to come back and hit. So if master has reduced the volume, where is the rest going? Master is taking upon himself. Right? So that is why uh, when we, uh, we talk about uh, you know Jesus Christ, going on the cross for whom for his disciples uh, he did it for you know they, to take off he they take off the karma and take it upon themselves sri yukteswar we had read in previous chapters when he said i'm about i think i might die he had taken on the karma of his disciples and allowed it to work on his body master allowed it all this self realized ramkrishna paramhansa he went through the cancer throat cancer why they take it because they are unaffected. It doesn't really affect them, right? They are beyond all this. They are one with the cosmic consciousness. So the, the take, they take especially of their close disciples. They work it off on their body or in their consciousness so that these disciples can progress faster. So let us be counted among those uh, close disciples that our master has chosen for this faster uh, evolution. So uh, this, this part was very important. And the next one also, um, where that man makes so much effort. I mean, imagine climbing all that parts of uh, Himalaya, trying to find where is Babaji. And, uh, you know, 
that kind of uh, love, that kind of uh, willpower, that kind of dedication to meet Babaji. Why wouldn't he meet you? Um, even when we go to Babaji cave, I mean, we uh, that should be our wanting to meet Babaji kind, no? Like I have to, if, I mean, he was, I mean, we don't have to go to that extreme where he says, if you don't accept me, I'll jump off. And he says, jump. Because in this present state, I will not accept you. And uh, the, then, you know, uh, he later on, once that man does, he just brings him up and he says, now you are ready. You know, he saw the love that he was giving. And then he says, now you are really ready for discipleship. Each one of us who is here, who are disciple of our great gurus, we are lucky that we didn't have to uh, pay uh, that kind of, uh, you know, this thing, obeisance, where we had to give go through that kind of test. And he has already accepted us. That's so much, this should be gratitude. And we should not let it uh, go away like that, you know. Like, if he has accepted us, uh, there must be some thing that we have done in our past lives that has brought us to this point where he has accepted us as the disciple. What we do from here, that is most important. That's what we always say, you know, like your good karma has brought us to the path, to the point where we are initiated into karma. Once a kriya, but once we are initiated in kriya, what do we do with that? That is very important because from there, our free will starts. After once we have received the Kriya, what we do? We just let it go and get back into this world and, you know, just let it go. Or do we uh, really make our efforts to be free? As Master said, Kriya Yoga is the airplane route to God. Are we making that happen with our, um, our own spiritual progress? That is in our hand, right? That's our free will. Okay. So he says, an avatar lives in the omnipresent spirit. For him, there is no distance inverse to the square. Only one reason, therefore, can motivate Babaji to maintain his physical form because it was a divine intervention. And how did it come? Through his little younger sister, who, uh, and how could he refuse? No? This is younger sister. He says, uh, Jesus knew from the beginning the sequence of his life. He knew because he was an avatar. Even master, uh, though it seems like, you know, Mukunda is going through this, Mukunda was going through that, but they knew exactly what they, they are going to go through. Uh, even when we had spoken about his uh, uh, friend, Dhirananda, whom he had taken with him and master told that, I always knew that he was going to betray me, yet he allowed it to happen. Similarly, Jesus Christ knew from the beginning what is going to happen with him. Imagine if any one of us, knew what is going to happen with us, how are we going to live our life? Are, uh, you know, Jesus Christ, who I, would I, I mean, if we were there, we would say, oh, the hai. people were going to, they are not going to be nice to me. They are going to put me on the uh, cross. Why would I do this? Why would I do that? You know, that is what the people like us would do. But Jesus knew he's an avatar. He knew why he was here. He knew exactly the sequence of his event, yet he allowed each one of it to happen. And uh, it, it, when he, they say that his four reporters, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are recording it. Why? So that, not because to tell us, oh, Jesus was so great. No. Jesus allowed uh, that, that all this be, you know, they were his witness. So that what was happening to him, what he did, all that had to be noted down. So that each one of us knows what is our true potential. Each one of us can be the son of God. How? And th for that, it, this is being written not to show, oh, Jesus was so great, right? Similarly, Babaji also, he says there is no relativity of past, present, future. From the beginning, he has known all phases of his life. Now, but again, he has played many acts of his divine life in the presence of one or more witnesses why because it needs uh, he says that you know he uttered this promise before ram gopal mazumdar that it might finally become known for the inspiration of others seeking our hearts that's it not to say oh, baba ji my goodness how he was what what a great man he was no it was for each one of us to show our true potential if 
each one, which also means that these avatars have become avatar, but they have gone from the stages we have been, right? We are. So that is why they say that bahut, the Guru has a lot of karuna. Why? Because he has lived all this. He has passed all this and they have gone on to become Jivan Mukta and then Param Mukta. They have gone to that state and now come back as avatar. So they know it all. All the struggles that each one of us goes through, all those small you know, uh, ego problems that we face, everything, they have been there. And they have worked at it to become perfected and be where they are. And they have come back to show us that each one of us that, that is our, uh, you know, our goal that we need to work towards. Uh, so here, as Christ says, Father, I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So I say it aloud so that people can hear it and understand it. Uh, Master also, you know, Swamiji writes in the new path. They had this, uh, they were all meditating together. And then Master said, uh, he had this vision of Divine Mother. And he said, Uma, you are so beautiful. You are so beautiful. And then after some time, he says, oh, don't go. Why are you going? Oh, you are saying that the, the darkness and, you know, the delusion of all these people is making you go away. He said it all aloud. Why? So that people can hear and understand that. If he could have the vision of Divine Mother, each one of them, why weren't they, they having those visions? Because she says that I can't be in this room. There's so much of darkness. You know, that, that is the reason. And that is why they say it out aloud. So they also know that it is possible to uh, have visions of Divine Mother. So I sometimes felt my... Uh, Okay, so left. So Ram Gopal Mazumdar, uh, Master once told Swamiji that he was completely liberated. He was a Jeevan Mukta. And he says, look at the, uh, the how uh, Lahiri Mahasaya's uh, this thing was. He would come down to Banaras and sometimes sit with his disciples to meditate. And one day Lahiri Mahasaya says, go, go to the Ghat. He says, I went. And then he sees this beautiful vision of. Mataji coming up and then Lahiri Mahashaya and Babaji coming in lights. What what beautiful, what ethereal uh, vision it would have been. No, the whole scene must have been. And uh, Lahiri Mahashaya touching the feet. Lahiri Mahashaya himself has become an avatar, right? He has worked at it after being initiated and he's an avatar. Yet, when his guru came, he bowed. Master, even Paramansa Yogananda, the, Swamiji said he had a you know, a beautiful, this thing of painting or uh, somebody had gifted him of Sri Yukteswar. He put it outside his room and he said, whenever he would go up and he would see that, that picture, he would bow and then go into his room. They always remembered who was instrumental in making them who they are today. And then the whole thing uh, plays out where the sister makes the demand and Babaji couldn't refuse his little sister. And he says, the Lord has spoken his own wish through your lips. And again, here, Maram Gopal Madhunda was a witness. And, uh, and then he goes back and the other uh, uh, disciples say, he was always here. He never went. And he was actually giving a discourse on immortality, where uh, Ram Gopal Madhunda was seeing, watching the scene where Babaji was... Uh, promising immortality for uh, himself. So he says, for the first time, I fully realize the truth in the scriptural verses which state that a man of self-realization can appear at different places in two or more bodies at the same time. And we have seen previous chapters of Lahiri Mahashaya doing this time and again, you know, for his disciples in Calcutta, whereas he was in Banaras. So he has done this often. I mean, this is such a beautiful chapter. And um, Babaji has been chosen by God to remain in his body for the duration of this particular world cycle. So once God, you know, this, this day of Brahma, once uh, uh, God retreats it all back, till then Babaji is going to remain here. And as ba Babaji also promised that uh, whoever takes his name uh, with reverence 
will be blessed with instant spiritual blessing. These are very important points for each one of us to remember. And he also said that I will continue to keep my body, but I will be only visible to few. Who are those few? Whoever he deems is ready to see him. We should be one of them, no? in any form and be ready to, because he might come as we have seen this painting. The painting that is there in the book is uh, what master Paramansa Yogananda described to his brother. Uh, I think his name was Sam, Sada, Sananda. And he had drawn it. And that that painting still hangs in Four Garpa Road in uh, master's house, where Babaji had visited him also. <clears throat> so it's a precious uh, uh, picture. So, you know, we can all hope that uh, he deems us also. And for that, we need to work at it. We need to work at our attunement. We need to work at um, constantly calling out to him in our meditations and in our everyday, you know, the even mundane life, how we live our life, that he deems us, us fit enough to uh, be able to see him. Otherwise, we, we can always feel his presence, his guidance it will, will always be there. The moment we think about him, we will get his instant spiritual blessing that is always there. So let us keep calling out to him. And uh, this week, let us tune into uh, Babaji in our meditations. Think about him, do japa on him. Um, let, us, that, let that be our takeaway. And maybe even read this book, this chapter again. Visualize those scenes at the Sasamed, the Ghat. Uh, if you ever visit Varanasi and go there, just know that, you know, Mataji is still there in one of the under, underground cave, though it might look, you know, all concretized and um, different, but they, he, she is very much there. And that is the place where this, this uh, blessed meeting happened, which Ram Gopal Mazumdar was blessed enough to witness. So with that, any anybody wants to add anything or we can end today's Joy to you all. Jai Babaji. See you next week.